Perhaps no matchup in chess history has been as anticipated as that between Emmanuel Lasker and Jose Capablanca. At the time that our featured game was played in 1914 at the Great St. Petersburg Tournament, Lasker had already been undisputed champion for 20 years, since 1894. However, there were new talents on the scene, like Rubinstein and like Capablanca, and the chess world was demanding a match. Now, due to World War I, it would be seven long years before such a match would come to fruition, and until then, the world would have to look to this game. Fortunately, this game was everything that one could have hoped for, and in it, Lasker showed that he was still the man to beat, and he would not be relinquishing his title easily. Lasker selects as his opening move, pawn to e4. Capablanca replies pawn to e5, and after knight f3, knight c6, and bishop b5, we have Roy Lopez. This is an opening that Capablanca was very, very strong in, nearly unbeatable. Here he selects pawn to a6, and Lasker decides on bishop takes c6, the exchange Roy Lopez. Now, today this is not considered a very fearsome approach from white, but Lasker played this in this game and in other games and showed some strong ideas and had good success with the opening. Of course, it's only modern analysis that indicates that there are serious problems with giving up the bishop hair here. After d takes e6, the natural and correct move to open up this bishop, we get pawn to d4. Note, you cannot capture on e5 because of queen d4, hitting the knight, hitting the e-pawn, regaining the pawn, and after knight of three, queen takes e4 check, queen e2, queen takes, king takes, white's king has been seriously inconvenienced, and black is clearly better. So it is the move pawn to d4, pawn takes d4, and queen takes d4. This line leads to an early queen trade, queen takes d4, and knight takes d4. This position is very strategically interesting. If it were possible to just hoover off all of the minor pieces and the rooks and get straight to a king and pawn endgame, then white would actually be theoretically winning with the majority on the king side because black can't create a passed pawn on the queen side and white can on the king side. I've done a number of practice games where I've played this out myself and white's winning plan is really not that difficult. Of course, things are not so simple. White is not able to just trade off all of these pieces that actually requires a lot of work. And within these pieces, there's an important imbalance. Black has the bishop pair and the position is fairly open. Today, we understand that the bishop pair has a lot of value in the exchange with Lopez and also in the Berlin defense, and black really has very good prospects. The extra pawn, so to speak, that is uh, encompassed in the king side majority is really hard to mobilize and is not as relevant as all of the middle game factors and the bishop pair. However, it of course takes a long time to prove that, and this game was a step on the journey to show that, and it showed some of the strengths of white's position. Here we get bishop to d6, knight c3, knight to e7, natural play, white castles kingside, and black chooses to do the same, which maybe black doesn't have to do. Of course, it's very, very natural to castle kingside in most games, but here black could choose not to castle for the time being or arrange to castle queenside, and that might be more productive. There are many, many exchange Rui Lopez positions where black does castle queenside. So after castles, we now see the move pawn to f4, and we get our first comment on the game from Capablanca. He says, this move I considered weak at the time, and I do still. It leaves the e-pawn weak, unless it advances to e5, and makes it possible for black to pin the knight by bishop to c5. Capablanca continues rook to e8. Now the knight falls back to b3, avoiding the pin and also taking control of the c5 square, and pawn to f6, about which Capablanca says, preparatory to b6, followed by c5 and bishop to b7, in conjunction with knight to g6, which would make it extraordinarily hard for white to maintain the center pawns. Lasker now makes a dramatic, committal, and controversial decision. He plays the move pawn to f5. Much has been said about this move. It has both pros 
and cons, and objectively, it is better for Black after best play. But to be fair, Black was already clearly better with best play without this move, so one can't criticize it too much as a mistake. Any mistakes have already been made. Now, after this move pawn to f5, let's consider first the cons. This move permanently weakens the e4 pawn, making it a serious target. It also weakens the square in front of the pawn, making it possibly usable by the black bishop or by a knight if the knight can route itself to this e5 square. On the pro side though, the move does gain a potential outpost on e6, and if a knight can get there, it will be a very, very fearsome piece. The move also restricts black. The bishop on c8 and the knight on e7 lack some critical squares and it starts to be a little clumsy for black to maneuver. Now, black can solve these problems, but it's not so easy. Let's hear what Capablanca himself had to say about the move. It has been wrongly claimed that this wins the game, but I would like nothing better than to have such a position again. According to the classical laws of the Steinitz theory, this is indeed a dubious venture. White devalues his pawn majority on the king side, giving himself a weak backward pawn on e4, whereas black is presented with a powerful outpost at e5. Aren't these rather too many defects for one move? But Lasker's eagle eye is trained on the e6 square. Capablanca plays the move pawn to b6, and Lasker plays the best move, the developing bishop f4, challenging the bishop here on d6. Now, in this position, Capablanca makes a very serious error, probably the most serious error in the game, bishop to b7. Now, this move is not losing yet, but it immediately turns over the advantage and it becomes extremely challenging for Capablanca to play this position. He makes many insightful comments. Played against my better judgment. The right move was, of course, bishop takes f4. Dr. Lasker gives the following variation. Bishop takes f4, rook takes f4, pawn to c5, rook to d1, bishop to b7, rook to f2, rook a to d8, rook takes d8, rook takes d8, rook d2, rook takes d2, and knight takes d2. And white, he claims, has the best of it. But as Nimzovich pointed out immediately after the game, the move 16, rook a d8, is not the best. If rook a c8, exclamation point, then white will have great difficulty in drawing the game, since there is no good way to stop black from playing knight to c6, followed by knight e5, threatening knight to c4. And should white attempt to meet this maneuver by withdrawing the knight at b3, then the black knight can go to d4, and the white pawn at e4 will be the object of attack. Taking Dr. Lasker's variation, however, Whatever advantage there might be disappears at once if black plays knight c6, threatening knight b4 and also knight d4, neither of which can be stopped. If white answers knight to d5, knight to d4 for black will at least draw. In fact, after knight c6, black threatens so many things that it is difficult to see how white can prevent the loss of one or more pawns. This analysis by Capablanca is fully supported by modern engine analysis, and this was the correct way to play when black is better. All of this, I think, is a little bit unintuitive for a variety of reasons. Moves like rook a c8 seem very passive, but the idea of playing c5, bishop b7, without allowing a knight to go to d4 and onto e6, and then maneuvering the knight in is just so effective that black can delay developing the rooks and doing other useful things long enough to achieve that plan. Now, after the natural move, bishop to b7, looking to develop the last minor piece that is not developed, we see bishop takes d6, Pawn takes d6. First off, we should note that the exchange on d6 has created a weak d pawn here. And one, one wonders why Capablanca would ever have allowed this, even if you take his next comment at face value, when he could have avoided creating a weak c pawn or a weak d pawn here and exchanged on f4 when the rook would have had to recapture here and would not have been very effective on the f4 square. In any case, 
in this position on the board, we now see the move knight to d4 and Capablanca surprisingly comments, it is a curious but true fact that I did not see this move when I played bishop to b7. Otherwise, I would have played the right move, bishop takes f4. Now, I'm certainly going to believe Capablanca when he says this. Why would he lie about a significant oversight like this? But it's still very surprising for a great player like himself. Of course, we are all humans and we do miss things, but the move knight d4 is just so natural in this position and the bishop on c8 was covering the square. Its absence means that the idea of sinking the knight into e6 is very, very troublesome indeed. So after knight d4, Capablanca decides that he can't really effectively prevent the knight from going to e6 without becoming far too passive, so he plays the move rook a d8. The knight does hop into e6, and Capablanca brings the rook up to d7. At this point, Lasker is just going to pressure the d6 pawn. He is clearly better, and it becomes very difficult for Capablanca to maneuver at all. We get rook a d1, and here a passive move from Capablanca, knight c8. The engine preference was for the move pawn to c5, which is nice in that it opens up this bishop here, but you can also understand why Capablanca didn't really want to play pawn c5 because it will allow a knight to go to d5 at some point if the knight so chooses. The move knight c8 is quite passive, and it intends Rook over to e7, and then rook goes and captures on e6, giving up the exchange but eliminating the strong knight. Capablanca, however, never follows through on his plan. We now get the move rook f2, clearly intending to double rooks, b5, rook f to d2, the doubling is achieved, rook over to e7, the idea here is to sacrifice the exchange, and now pawn b4. I think this is an excellent move from Lasker. It freezes the queen side to his advantage, and now it's very, very difficult to find activity for the bishop on b7. So after b4, the question is, should Capablanca have captured on e6? In this position or in the next position? Well, he does decline to do it here. He plays king f7 first, a a valuable improvement of the king, and one can understand playing this before sacrificing the exchange. But after a3, in Capablanca's own words, his move bishop to a8 is probably a mistake. And he says, Once more, changing my plan, and this time without any good reason. Had I now played rook takes e6, f takes e6, rook takes e6, as I had intended to do when I went back with the knight to c8, I doubt very much if white would have been able to win the game. At least it would have been extremely difficult. In some sense, it's easy to make this claim after the game to say, I should have sacrificed the exchange and you probably couldn't have defeated me there. Now, I do think it would have been quite difficult for Lasker to win after the sacrifice of the exchange. The e4 pawn is weak and it's hard to make progress in the position. But I do think he would have won, and I don't think it would have been nearly as difficult as Capablanca seems to indicate. I mean, look, for example, at how bad the bishop is here on a8. Lasker really doesn't need to do much to start proving the value of the rooks. a4 will open a line on the queen side, and a rook will be able to get over there relatively quickly. I do think Capablanca is correct that sacrificing the exchange is the best bet as you see the game develop, but I don't think it would have saved the game. After bishop to a8, we see king f2, rook to a7, g4. This is very instructive, and now at this point, Lasker has a stranglehold on the position, and his prosecution of this advantage is just one that you should absolutely take notes from. You want to play on both sides of the board. So here we're seeing pawn to g4 and the seizure of more space. When you have control, use that to maximize your spatial advantage, to maximize your piece activity, and just relish the fact that your opponent can't do anything and try to take as much of the board as you can before you force any decisive action. So after g4, we see pawn to h6 trying to stop the break pawn to g5. We get rook d3, pawn to a5, looking to open a line on the queen side, but it really can only work to white's advantage as we'll see later. 
you're not going to get anywhere with a single rook right here. Pawn to h4, further expansion, exchange on b4 here, rook e to a7, maybe considering again the sacrifice of the exchange, but if you wait too long, it's only getting worse. White's position has continued to improve. So king f3, rook over to g8, king f4, pawn to g6, trying to uh, not get squashed, but more open lines are favoring white because white controls so much of the board. Rook to g3, thinking about pawn to g5, so g5 is kind of forced from black, but now king to f3. You can capture a pawn over here, but you're not winning a pawn because, of course, that pawn will soon fall, and it will just leave you with a very weak and falling pawn here on h6. So you want to try to keep the h-file closed, but you can't do that. Knight to b6, the knight is headed to an ostensibly pretty square, but it won't be able to do anything much over there, and it's running out of time. White now plays pawn takes g5, pawn takes g5, and rook to h3. As I said, not enough time for counterplay. White is already getting there. Rook over to d7, king to g3, a very patient move. King to e8, and rook d to h1, doubling on the open file, and invasion is now considered. For example, rook up to h6 might be good, maybe rook h8 is also good, and you can start attacking weak pawns and creating serious, serious tactical problems for black. Bishop to b7, and this is a great point to pause your video and try to figure out how Lasker played in this position. There are a number of ways to maintain the advantage, but only one is really instructive and decisive in a beautiful and thematic way that makes this game incredibly memorable. The move Lasker plays is pawn to e5, a wonderful clearance sacrifice. The pawn is given up so that the knight on c3, which is white's one piece that isn't perfectly positioned, can jump in to e4. The sacrifice of the pawn just doesn't end up being relevant. Chess is a game of squares. As in Parks and Rec and the game Cones of Dunshire, it's all about the cones. Chess is really all about the squares. We get caught up in material, but chess is a game of 64 squares and it's a game where you need to focus on controlling squares. Here, the square e4 is much more important than the pawn that was on that square, and once the knight gets to e4, black will not be able to hold all of these very, very soft points. After the break, pawn to e5, we see Capablanca capture with d takes e5, and now knight to e4. There's a very, very simple threat here. Uh, it is invasion here on c5 and it's unstoppable. Knight to d5 and knight 6 to c5. Now, this move just wins material. Capablanca plays bishop c8 and he doesn't have anything better. Why can't he just move the rook here that's attacked by the knight? Well, if in this position you play, for example, rook over to e7, then you can go for this move right away, or you could capture on b7, and after rook takes, you have knight to d6 check with a fork, you win the whole rook on b7, and obviously, very, very much game over. So, after knight 6 to c5, Capablanca surrenders in exchange. Of course, this is the kind of position that you get after not having sacrificed the exchange on e6, where you say, I really should have sacrificed the exchange on e6 because I'm forced to do it now, many moves later, of course, and I get absolutely nothing for it. Knight takes d7, bishop takes d7, Rook to h7, the reason to control an open file is to invade on an open file, and the reason to control a second open file is to invade on that open file. It's very beautiful how the rook swings over, and we have both the h file and the a file to work with. When you have more space than your opponent, you should use all of it, and this is a beautiful illustration. King over to d8, rook to, h to a8 with check, such beautiful rooks. Bishop back to c8, and after knight c5, which threatens rook to d7 check, which will lead to mate, and threatens knight to b7 check, which will lead to mate, and threatens knight to e6 check, which will lead to mate. In this position, Capablanca resigned. Lasker had a great note after the game. He said, the, the audience had been watching the final moves breathlessly. That Capablanca's position was in ruins was evident to all. And then the Cuban turned over his king. 
From the assembled audience, there emerged such a roar of applause as I have never heard in my whole career as a chess player. It was like the applause one hears in a theater, which erupts spontaneously and of which the audience is totally unconscious. I hope that you have had some measure of the experience that the audience had while watching the game live. This is truly a clash of the Titans, one of the great games in chess history, and I think it well deserves its place as my number one best chess game of the 1910s. If you want to see more of the games that made it onto my top 10 list from the 1910s, then simply click on the playlist that is popping up on your screen as I speak.